<laughs> um, all right, so let's start with this. Um, Aoife, I'll, I'll start with you. We'll go to Allison. So um, outside of songwriting and maybe specifically journal writing, um, Aoife, how much, do you, how much writing outside of songwriting, if any, are you doing, I guess, and if there's any journaling involved, songwriters tend to fall into three categories, I've noticed. Those that journal, those that don't, but wish they did, and those that don't and have no desire to ever start. I'm so number three. <laughs> you are? Oh, really? Okay. Um, so there's nothing, not even like any kind of like jotting down of things for outside of that song. I think, no, I think I do jot down stuff. I think I just, um, I, I guess, to, like I'm having a reaction to the word somebody that journals like to use the word journal as <laughs> as a as a verb like that yeah that's not that's not my thing but i but i do i do write down ideas like on scraps of paper or in an iphone note or like i have like a little notebook that i might like if i have a, a phrase of an idea i'll write it down but i i i don't consider it journaling um but i i am very happy for people who do you know have that as an outlet that's just not my thing i and i i i really it's funny though because if i if i we're not a songwriter and a musician. I do feel if I could go back and, and live another life that where I was a different version of myself, I would love to be a journalist. Ah. Which I guess is technically someone who journals. Someone who's journal. <laughs> now, <laughs> for, you, for a living even. I'm a big <laughs> conundrum, I suppose. Do you have, I'm also, I've also heard that some songwriters actually do they'll tell me this in secret, have elaborate filing systems for those ideas. Uh, gosh, I've heard Excel spreadsheets, Word documents. Like when you have all these ideas, um, you know, do you ever do you ever think, oh, where was that? Was it in the voice memo? Was it in the notebook? Like, is there a way to kind of store these to go back to them for when you might need them? I, I, I are you still asking me or is it right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll stay with um, me a little bit, Allison. I... I do have a lot of ideas on voice memos that sometimes if I'm on, on a long flight, I'll listen back to voice memos from like the last 10 years. And sometimes I will find stuff. I wish to God I were the kind of person who had an elaborate filing system for that and anything like my spices or my clothes or like, I. but that's just not like, unfortunately, I, I, I feel like I'm always just barely staying afloat of like keeping myself and my family fed and like somewhat clean. Like I, I just, it's just, it just like I, I wish again in my, in my other life where I'm a journalist and I write for, you know, an esteemed publication, I will have elaborate filing systems for everything in my life. But right now I'm just trying to like use my free time to play the guitar and go for a run. Like that's, that's where yeah. I'm at. Um, all right, Allison, how about you? Where do you fall in that, in that, uh, in that category? There are points of resonance and also places where we diverge. I am someone who, I am now someone who journals. I used to, I mean, I think I always have been, I've always been someone who just wrote copiously in little leather bound <laughs> volumes and I still do it. And it's not necessarily, um, you know, this is what happened today. Type of it's just free form writing mostly for me. Sometimes it does end up being processing something that I'm going through, but often it's just more abstract and free form and stream of consciousness for me. And that does then dovetail with jotting down song ideas or poem ideas. And I do write outside of songwriting now more than maybe I ever have before. Uh, because I'm working on a book. And so I've just written my first book proposal and, you know, sort of had my first um, rounds of meeting uh, with some publishers and things like that. So that has been an interesting process. And I've written the first few chapters of this book that I'm working on. And, and so it, that's a whole new world, but very much like Aoife, I really wish I had that lovely A-type personality to be able to organize everything and have things just so, but my truth is a lot more haphazard and chaotic than that. I have a lot of notes on my phone. I, I've just started to use the, the um, word system because that's what um, I had to do in order to submit my book proposal. And so that's been quite lovely for working on longer form writing. Um, that feels a bit more organized for me, but I tend to use Google Drive and documents like a book of poetry, basically. But then I also still am very analog where poetry usually comes through first with a pencil in my 
journal. Um, my currently, let's see, swag. Usually it's like swag from something. This is from the Pitchfork Social Salt Spring Island in BC series. They gave us these lovely books. <laughs> That's what I'm writing. That's in so great. <laughs> so there's always, you know, it's always some sort of like something we got at some show or something some gig somewhere and I use that. BMI gave me some lovely big notebooks. So I'm using one and Ida's using one for her uh, fan fiction for Wings of Fire. <laughs> so so you know, Allison, are you, a, when it comes to those lyrics and Allison, are you a pen and paper, you are a pen and paper person? Both, both. I think I was exclusively a pen and paper person for a long time. And then uh, modern times forced me to adapt. And I do a lot of jotting things down in the notes of the phone. And I do a lot of humming melodies and ideas either into voice memos, or I have this little app on my phone that is, you know, that's like a rudimentary kind of a four track set type of thing. So if I think of often harmony ideas will come to me along with the main melody. So I'll hum a few things along just to kind of try not to lose it before I have time to go back. Like Aoife, you know, we're working moms. So finding the time, the undisturbed time for me tends to be between the hours of midnight and like 4 a.m. So I'll jot things down in the day in whatever way, whether it's in a journal or in the notes or in Google Drive or in the Word app or in my little four track app. And, and then I'll work on it in the wee hours when it's quiet and I feel like I can get closer to uh, I don't know, the, the slipstream than I can during the day when it's dogs and kid and all of that. Yeah, okay, so I wanna, I wanna go back. We'll talk about the ritual in a couple of minutes, um, like the specifics of it, but Aoife, let me go back to you. Um, rather than make this like a, a, the standard COVID question, you know, about how much did you get done? I, I think I'd like to phrase it as how much do you, how, how much do you get done with large expanses of time? I find that th th this idea, I think when COVID first happened that people thought, oh, all of you songwriters will get so much done because you're not touring and this is great and you have all this free time. And in fact, a lot of people, I'm the same way. Like I, I make false deadlines for myself as a writer. Like if I, it, it, if I say to myself, you know, I've got to have this done by X, I'll get it done. But if you say to me, I've got 30 days, I won't. So if I guess my question for you is when it comes, do you write better under deadline or with large expanses of time? I think I think it's it's not really an either or question for me. I think in the past, I've always had had more of a deadline because, you know, it, it's between touring cycles, you schedule your recording dates and then you have to have your songs done by the time you're going to make your record and you need that record done because the tour is already booked for your album release and it's slotted in with your labels timeline to get the album out so there's there, there are just so many deadlines that exist because of how our industry is set up uh but that being said this year when or i guess <laughs> two years ago <laughs> yeah when um, when March 2020 came around, I just put out a record and was about had done one show and was about to tour it, and then that kind of went away. And and I did feel a little bit like, oh God, I, I the, all people want from me, from all people wanted from a lot of musicians in that first the, those first few months, those first four or five months even was content, was like videos, was sort of you know songs and little performances, and you were it just ended up being all the time that you had to do work was sort of rehashing stuff of it was doing like a three song thing for this a four song zoom happy hour of, of this it wasn't as much like you didn't actually have the time to you were still doing shows you know what i mean it was just you weren't on the road doing it when i came down here to florida in september of 2020 that's when i really did sort of start to say oh wow, i do have all this time and i have access to a studio so i did end up writing more than i've and, and releasing more music than i ever have before in my career so um i guess you could say that i i that means I did better with all this time, but it's 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 hard to say. I think it just sort of made the most of the situation. Do you think though, I mean, I told you earlier, right? we have four kids and I found that having kids makes me much more disciplined as a writer yeah. because I know I have like, like if I've got two, three hours in the day, I'm not going to say, hmm, I'll lounge around for an hour. It's like, oh, now I can get all this stuff done. Stuff done. Right. So do you find that, that, that having less time has made you more efficient because you know you have to be more productive in that small space? 
I, I think I've, 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 I'm just not really a lounge around kind of person. Like I, 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 I think in general, I'm a pretty efficient person and I, and my husband is efficient to a fault. It's like, I, we were both, we both try to get a lot of stuff done in a day and, and there's no wasted hour. Like sometimes I will, you know, go with them for the school drop-off so I can get out of the car and run home before, like do my, get my run in that way. So then I can take my shower and I'll like be humming songs in the shower and then get out and do something else. Like do all my phone calls on the way to somewhere. Like, you know, you just really have to make the most of, of every minute. But I think I've always been like that. Having a kid has, has just meant that there are, you know, fewer opportunities to do all the things that you want to do, but there are also more opportunities to do things that are better. It's, it's uh, it's just sort of like a, it's just yeah. a shift. Yeah. Allison, how about you? Would you call yourself like a disciplined writer? I am disciplined, I think, in the sense that I try to write every day, no matter what. Do. I don't know. That is the, dis I guess that is the practice for me, is what I would say. I'm not sure how discipline works for me creatively anymore, other than I think it's really important to play my instrument mm -hmm. even a little bit every day or an instrument mm -hmm. a little bit every day. It's important. I sing all the time. I mean, that's just sort of, that's not so much a discipline as like a self-soothing or something. I might as well be sucking my thumb, honestly, because it's like comforting to me to sing. And it always has been. And I did that before. I thought anyone would want to hear me do it. Um, you know, and I still do it. And I sing a lot with my daughter, actually. You know, that's one of the ways we bond. I've had this conversation with a lot of songwriters about the role of movement. <sighs> Um, I have been a runner for many years um, and ran track in college and, and have been running for a long time. And about five years ago, I'll send it to both of you. I wrote an article in the Washington Post about the role that exercise plays in higher order thinking. So there's now, so they put people and it's been in the lab. So it's been measured, put people on a treadmill for 30 minutes at, at moderate 60% max heart rate, which is like a, a moderate walk. And then after the treadmill, administer a battery of tests to those people. And those people always score higher than people who weren't on the treadmill uh, because of a chemical called brain-derived neurotrophic factor that's released in the brain during increased blood flow with, his ex with exercise. So there's clear there's clear evidence that exercise has an immediate, and it's for about 90 minutes post-exercise, about 90 minutes, you're at your creative peak. Um, and the good thing is it's not dose responsive. So an hour isn't twice as good as 30 minutes and 90% max heart rate isn't any better than 60%. I mean, this has, speaking of kids, this has enormous implications for why kids should be doing recess every day. Of course. But for, but for adults, right? And I know, and I've, I've read interviews where you talk about running, but I'd like to talk, I guess, more broadly about the role of movement because the things I've heard, the crazy things I've heard uh, you know, I interviewed Yola a couple weeks ago and she talked about how vacuuming, literally the sound, the vacuuming, and she said she's gotten song. It's so there's a couple of things. It's not just the sound of the vacuum, but it's the repetitive motion. It's when you're doing something that doesn't require brain power, your 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 creative mind can kind of go. So uh, so Ifa, we'll start with you. I mean, how it sounds like that's a big part of your process, but I'd love to talk about the role of movement to, to creativity with you. It is a huge part of my process. And I know that Ali is also a runner and it's yeah. like, for me, it's, 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 it's so multifaceted. It's a, it's, you know, a way to just maintain my physical health, which is sort of one side of it and b mental health, just having that sort of space in the day to, to have that is just mine that I am all alone. I never listen to music while I'm running. I always do headphone free, just out there listening to those, to, you know, whatever it is that's around me. And I also have so many songwriting ideas while I'm running, like like so many. Um, and just sort of figuring that out over the years and, and then being able to harness it. And sort of when I get back, I have so many voice memos, even that, so if I have my phone, if I'm on a long run and I don't want to get lost, where I'm like, <laughs> like breathing a hilarious, like trying to sing something into my phone in the middle of the woods while running. Um, but I do think that movement, yeah, it, it's it's a huge part of the process for me of just sort of having that car carving out that time again, it's sort of back to to maximizing your day. If you think about that time as being a part of your creative, if you, if you if you know that exercise, daily exercise is something that you were prioritizing and creativity is something you're prioritizing, why not marry them? Why not say, well, I can try to do both at once? Or at least start, you know, do one thing and start the other thing while I'm still doing this thing. That's that's kind of how I think about it. 
Yeah. Do you also use it as a, if you're in a rut, maybe you feel like, you know, you're stuck in a part is, can exercise be a way to kind of jumpstart that process for you? Not necessarily for me. I mean, I, I think it probably could be, but I, but I, uh, I've never, I've never, I haven't used it in that way specifically, I don't think yeah. I like them, but that's probably just based on like circumstance of not like everything is so timed out in my day and it has, sort of has been, even, even when you're on tour, it's sort of like, you know, before I had a child, I was on tour all the time. And that's your day is also not quite your own when you're on tour. So everything is everything. Like, I'm just very used to having a very scheduled day, with very limited time. So it's not often that I'm sort of sitting around and could be in the middle of working on something and get up and go for a run to get out of a rut. I love that idea. And I think next time I take myself on a solo writing retreat, I will employ that. But in, in, at this point, I just don't have the schedule. Yeah. So, okay. So there's that movement part of it, the active part. Then songwriters tell me the mundane activities, like I said, the vacuuming, uh, the gardening, uh, chopping vegetables. These are things I've heard. Washing dishes, um, you know, the really mundane activities. Um, I've heard the vacuuming twice in the past month. That's why I bring it up. I just found that so interesting. I, but, I'm live. But, my vacuum is right. I can see my vacuum go. from here. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I'm going to hang up and start vacuuming. Do you ever notice, uh, Aoife, that, 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 that those, do you get song ideas in those mundane activities as well? I don't. I, 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 okay. I, I don't personally. I, those mundane activities for me, I, I, I like to use as a step out of, of that. Like if I'm cooking, I might be humming or something, but I'm usually trying to just like be in a different zone when I'm doing those sort of mundane tasks. Personally, I, um, I, yeah, that's, that's yeah. not, I, I've All never, right. yeah. Allison, how about you? Where do you, how, the role of movement to your creative process? Movement is extremely important to me in my creative process as well. Similar to Aoife's experience, I get probably my 80% of song ideas, writing ideas in general, um, working through if I'm writing a speech or if I'm writing an essay, working through it in my mind while my body is in motion is a really, really significant, important part of my process and also allows me to access, you know, I have a, a lot of trouble meditating in stillness. And so I think of for me, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm not much of a speed person. I'm, you know, I'll swim for two hours slowly. I'll run for two hours slowly. Um, I like to do distance running. I'm, I, you know, I've, I'm really into sort of half marathon to marathon distances as rate. Those are the only sort of races I've ever done because I love that process of when you, you know, when you push past the point you thought you could, and that's when there's actual peace to some degree in my mind, where I feel like it just unclutters the channels for ideas to come through, you know, totally. and for the, for the sort of nattering voices of uh, whatever it is, self-castigation or, you know, mindless repetition of things I don't need to repeat over and over again, stopping and allowing some other ideas to come through, you know, How about those mundane activities ever getting ideas when you're doing those mundane activities. Yeah. I mean, definitely like um, in the shower, I've gotten a lot of ideas coming, but I'm also usually <laughs> drumming on my body or stomping <laughs> rhythmically in the shower. Cause I'm a weirdo. And that's so these, you know, song ideas come through. And, you know, it started with, I think the shower stuff really intensified after motherhood where I would go to the shower to cry when I needed to and I didn't want to be scaring my kid. And, and that would just evolve into hand boning on my chest and coming up with some song, you know. But um, the, for me, I guess maybe sweeping of all those, the, the vacuuming is not peaceful for me. No good ideas have ever come through to me of vacuuming. I find vacuuming really stressful and it terrifies my child and my dog. Like they both are really auditory sensitive beings and they hate the sound of the vacuum. And so whenever I'm vacuuming, I'm conscious of trying to do this as quickly as possible so that this sound that upsets my babies stops as quickly as possible. You said sweeping. You said sweeping. Actually. Sweeping. Yeah. I love like an old, I have an old fashioned 
broom and I like like a thatch kind of a broom with a wooden handle and I love sweeping I'm actually I, and if I'm upset if I'm upset as well I will manically sweep the house and the front porch oh, amazing it calms me down and and That's there is something cool. about this there, it's a pleasing sound we have a lot of hardwood floors in our house and so <laughs> that sound we have a dog that a, a rescue puppy who sheds like nobody's business. And so I do a lot of sweeping and it's very satisfying to me. And I also do a lot of dishes by hand. And that's also, I'm, I'm like a Luddite that thinks that the dishwasher doesn't really get anything clean. So I'm really into doing dishes by hand. And it was an activity I did with my grandma that I loved. And she used to, in fact, sing me you know, creepy Scottish murder ballads and lullabies, my maternal grandmother, when we did dishes. And so I associate doing dishes and the warmth of the water with that kind of happier, happier moments from childhood. And, yeah. and, the, and the hidden, I associate it with the hidden canon as well, which is what I like to call all of those sorts of distilled through time and wisdom and orig original authorship unknown, but often women's voices being represented there where they aren't anywhere else. You know, the kind of folkloric, um, vast archive that was orally transmitted originally and only later written down. I, I think of that as the hidden canon and that's a, a rich source for me of inspiration. So I just read a study um, and I've heard this from songwriters too, about how many song ideas they get when they are just on the cusp of sleep. Not when they're fully asleep and not when they wake up and they're just on the cusp. And so I actually just read the study a couple of days ago that came out and it was, it was so, it was fascinating because they referenced Salvador Dali. And I'm think, I think I'm getting this right, but what he would do is he would kind of lay in this, he had this chair he'd lay in and he'd hold a skeleton key and and when the skeleton key dropped, it's when he fell asleep. He's falling asleep, but the, the dropping of the key and the sound would wake him up. And when he woke up, he'd furiously start to, to create because he wanted to be in that moment just when he was in that kind of dozing off. And apparently now there's some research. They just did these tests with people and found that those people, I think they woke up from an extended sleep, weren't nearly as prolific as those people who were just woken up after like a minute or two. So it, it, I just read about this. It was in Smithsonian Magazine, um, the study. So I thought that was really cool. So Aoife, has that ever happened to you? You know, not when you wake up after, a, you know, a long sleep, but just like on the cusp of that. I've never been woken up like that. If I'm, if I, somebody wakes me up right after I fall asleep, like my reaction would probably sound like what you're hearing right now, like a child crying. Um but I have dreamt song ideas that I'll then wake up. Like I've dreamt ex entire songs that then I wake up and just spend the next, you know, or the middle of the night trying to like grasp at the shards of the dream um, or in the morning, like the, it'll pop into my head later in the day, like this melody that I remember dreaming, but ne never in that moment, that specific moment. I'm curious, like in the study, was this a study with actual professional songwriters? No, no, no. It was, okay. not, it was not, it was, I think it was creative types. I need to, I just okay. saw the study today. Um, and it reminds me a little bit, I don't know if you ever read the novel, uh, it came out a couple of years ago, Homeland Elegies. Um, the author's name is Akhtar and he won the Pulitzer Prize for some other book. Um, is but he the South he, African writer? No. He's not South African. I forgot what he is, but he's not South African. But um, the, the main character in the story is also a writer and someone told him to uh, to tie a pencil to his finger, his writing hand, so that when he wakes up, he doesn't have to fumble for the pencil. It's there and he can, because someone told him that it was this weird thing where if your spine isn't aligned and if you don't do it immediately, it vanishes. And so he would sleep with the pencil tied to his hand. That's so funny. Uh, yeah, it's, Very it's, dangerous, but probably that. effective. So. Um, Allison, how about you? Has that happened to you ever uh, in those situations? You know, similar to Eve, I've, I've dreamt elaborate music and then woken up and tried to capture some of it. Um, I, you know, I'm trying to think if I've had, I think before my daughter, that happened more because now if I'm woken up out of sleep, it's generally her and it's generally a, an intense need that needs to be attended to in that moment and there's no time 
to allow, you know, whatever came through in the liminal threshold space to shine or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just like, I paid the bed or I'm thirsty or, you know, whatever it is. <laughs> and um, yeah, so not recently, but I'm trying to, I do feel like there were times in the early days of my first serious band, Poe Girl, I'm someone who falls asleep instantly when we're in motion okay. on the road. And so I just sleep like that's my tour gift is I can sleep anywhere, literally anywhere and in any uncomfortable, ridiculous position in any moving vehicle like that's my and, and frankly, I'm terrified most of the time when I'm in a specifically a vehicle on the road. I feel much safer in planes than I do in cars and vans, but I've spent the majority of my touring life in cars and vans. And I've only ever done a couple of bus tours um, with other projects, our native daughters. And you know, when I was a guest on Stuart McLean's Vinyl Cafe before he passed away. And those were fascinating because the, I wrote, well, m my recent, my most recent record is called Outside Child. And I wrote a lot of it on the Our Native Daughters tour bus in 2019. Um, and it was being in this bunk space and having, my daughter wake me out of sleep quite frequently because she was just nervous about the new situation. She was a, you know, working class musician's kid. So she was used to the van tours and was totally freaked out by the bus and, <laughs> and the uh, bunks. And it was a particularly derelict, gross bus. So, you know, it, was, it wasn't great, but um, the company was great. The bus itself, we were all terrified. So, uh, you know, there was a lot of being woken out of just having fallen asleep. And I did write a ton on that tour. I mean, I, I many of the seeds for Outside Child, you know, kind of germinated on that tour and and started to sprout. And uh, yeah, so kind of I, I, so I I'm now very curious to try that experiment. I've had that happen accidentally with my cell phone. <laughs> falling asleep with it in my hand, like trying to send an email when I'm just really, really tired and it falling and me suddenly waking up. But unfortunately, in those moments, I have been thinking things like, oh, no, I told the label I would post this thing two days ago. <laughs> I better post it now. So the whatever creative energy was generated, I squandered utterly on panic on panic and and like social media posting you know yeah. <laughs> like so yeah that actually kind of reminds me you know i i have a, in my process like i i have a couple of quirks in my writing process like i will never write and revise in the same chair it's always someplace different um i don't know where i got that from but i feel like to me i never i need to be in a different space to revise and i did to write um, but I know that about myself, like, you know, I, for me, I think it's important to know what your ritual is, whether it's time of day, place, uh, you know, a cup of tea, coffee, whiskey, anything like that, because for me, that gives me confidence. If I know that I've been successful in those places before, it might be superstition, but I know at least, hey, there's a shot. So Aoife, are there, are there any, is there any kind of a ritual to your process where you tend to kind of try to do the same thing each time. I mean, I think that that's just one of the main differences between uh, songwriters who tour and people who lead a more stationary life as writers. Yeah. Um, because I, I've always, I, I love the idea of, of ritualistic writing. I just, I don't know if you've read the book, uh, Writers and Lovers by Lily King. Have you guys no. read this incredible novel? It's, I mean, it's, it's really like, it's one of the greatest, most enjoyable novels I've read in recent memory. It came out in, I think, 2020, early 2020. Um, it's about it, but it's about a young writer. And and it's all, a lot about her process as a writer, but and then sort of like her kind of hilar the, the hilarity that she is going through as a young woman in Boston in the late 90s. But she, she talks a lot about her process and the, the revising process. And while reading this book, I was had just finished Age of Apathy and I was thinking about how different the process of writing and revising as a songwriter and editing when you're writing a three minute song is just so different from writing anything longer than, I mean, a song is like, it takes up this much paper. And so the idea that you would write and edit in a different chair, to me, it's like you're writing like you would have to just be going back and forth <laughs> from one chair to the next chair like constantly. Um, but in terms of other rituals, I, 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 I just try to be very flexible and have a real open mind and not 
sort of like the opposite of what you were saying. For, for me personally, I don't like to get too attached to an idea or what's going to happen. And and for instance, I just did a, a co-writing session with some friends um, with Sarah and Sarah, we got together in my band, and I'm with her just, just to hang out. And we were like, maybe we'll write some songs, but maybe, maybe we won't. Because last time we got together, we wrote a ton of great songs and we loved every single second of it. We don't want to put that pressure on ourselves again and try to recreate the experience. Now that said, we got there and we did kind of get some good stuff going because we didn't, we didn't have the, we didn't make the ritual out of it. We just sort of got together. It was sort of like the, the exact opposite where you just sort of say, let's see what's going to happen. And maybe the magic will come that way instead. So I, I, for, for me, it's, it's very important to maintain that level of, of just being okay with whatever comes. Cause I don't know when I'm going to next be able to be in that specific place. If I'm on tour or if I'm not in Florida, I was just in Massachusetts for two weeks. So you, like, you just have to really be able to, to, to go with where, where, wherever your surroundings take you as a, as a touring musician, to finish a song in a green room, to finish a song during a sound check. I, yeah. I feel like there, there's de- like to really be able to workshop ideas, to revise on stage in front of a microphone. Yeah. Like that's another really cool thing about writing while on the road. Yeah. yeah. So true. Yeah. That's something I feel like several songs have come out of sound check, just sound check jams even. Totally. Totally. One of my favorite things of just the kind of, free, and it is that, you're freed. I hear what you're saying as well, Ben, of the, just that you love to have that sense of this is where where it worked for me before. Maybe it will work again. And that ritual sort of magic spell almost element. But I'm more of the school, you know, I've been 22 years on the road as a musician um, in various projects and as a writer that whole time as well. And evolving my own relationship with writing throughout the years. And I hope I will till the day I die be evolving that relationship. But I, similar to E5, just had to, if I was going to need a special chair, there's just no way I wouldn't, I wouldn't have written yeah. anything, you know, and I don't say that in a um, oh, yeah. meaning derogatory way at all to, to your process. Um, and I love that notion of maybe when I am home evolving a home ritual, because that's something new. This, where I'm speaking to you from is our first ever home. You know, I'm, I'm a 42 year old mom who's been on the road for 22 years and like really intensely on the road, like before, before the pandemic, uh, 250 days plus of the year on the road, you know, because I was, and, and still am, a working class musician where we couldn't take a year off and be okay. You know, we just couldn't, we're, we've never been in that position financially. And, um, and we're still not, you know, even with sort of a lot of doors have opened this year and having a real kind of stable and good label relationship for the first time and relationship with the song publisher and that sort of thing. And now hopefully soon a good relationship with a, with a literary publisher. Um, but it's still, that's also new, you know, and for, as Aoife said, so much of the early part of the pandemic wasn't this like endless time. It was now you have to somehow figure out a way to keep doing your job and feed the family while also having no childcare, while also having no school for them to go to, while also learning how to be a homeschool teacher. And guess what? I suck. I'm a horrible teacher horrible. My daughter doesn't want me to be her teacher in that way. You know, every day of the learning a curriculum, I'm great at supplementing what somebody else is doing. I'm awful at running the whole curriculum, you know? And luckily my partner JT is much better than I am at that. So it was, yeah. he really stepped, he filled the breach um, in those early days. But it was what I found so fascinating about that time was there was this narrative of, oh, we have all this time. There, there was no, we have, we're depressed. We're terrified when when the next work is going to come. I was definitely drinking too much at the beginning, but I had to go dry because it was just like, this is a, I doesn't need drunk, depressed mom for the rest of the pandemic. So I'm not going to do it. But, you know, there's like, I saw that road as in, uh, that was a road, you know, I didn't, didn't end up traveling it ultimately, but it's like, You know, it was not, and it was doing these, learning how to, the the lights that I am currently, you know, lit with, learning how to do our own lighting and how to set some sort of scene so that it's, you know, you can give a perform a, a virtual performance where someone can feel somewhat connected. I mean, it was, it was such, am I allowed to swear on this show? Sure. 
it was such a shit show, you know, <laughs> all of it for so long. And it was like figuring painfully figuring out these things that are someone's full-time job. Someone went to school to learn how to light. Someone went to school to learn how to engineer a session, you know, and do the whole thing. It wasn't me, you know, but I've, I learned slowly, painfully. In, and in fact, Yola and I, Yola and my family, we spent the, the early part of the lockdown together. We spent, ah, okay. yeah, we were living together. We lived together, you know, she would, whenever she came from England to work on her record here and work on her career here and build her team and all that great stuff, she was staying with us. And we were living in a house outside of Nashville and Madison that Rhiannon Giddens originally bought. And so we did the whole, we did the gardening and Yola set up a badminton net and archery with my sister, Anna, and I, we made the best of it, you know, and we learned to, I learned how to light. I, I went deep down the, the rabbit hole of how to light darker skin tones, because it turns out the median, her name is Shirley. This is what photographers use. And Shirley is even Aoife might be too dark for Shirley's template. You know, she's like, who's very, Shirley? Shirley is the template that all lighting directors up until very recently have used as their, and Shirley was a model in the thirties who was very white with blonde hair and blue eyes. And so okay. none of those lighting cues work for me or Yola, you know? So for those of you listening, I am a black woman and so is Yola. So, you know, it's, you know, it's like, it was so wild. Like all the things that I spent hours studying affordable lights. I spent hours studying what microphone. What, to why, why were you, what, what shows were you doing that required such an extensive, and now I feel like, what did oh. I do in the pandemic? I, I mean, like, I think, think I took like an Ikea lamp and pointed it at my face. I mean, like, I like, what, what, like, what well, were the, we were doing, so we did, we had to do Carnegie Hall with native daughters. We had to do the Monterey. Okay, so jazz fest we had to by video you know and like, like legit stuff okay and we, like and a- yola had tiny desk you know and so it was like okay and she had the rolling stone from your room that's when i i first got them for that because it was like well we got to figure out the lighting somehow because the lighting in our house was horrible and both yola and i disappeared you know it was like oh you can't see us at all you can see that's- jc and anna who are paler skinned <laughs> it's like, that is so gone. hilarious so we had to just learn like by default or some form of it. But I mean, these are the things that like the, the amount of time that you take, yeah. there wasn't even forming a ritual. It was like you form a ritual to undo it. You know, of course, as soon as we all got vaccinated and as soon as we could test and we could do other things and it started to ease up a bit, you know, we found our, we were incredibly lucky to meet the people who sold us this home this is our first ever forever home, you know? So as a 42 year old working class musician mom, I've never had a room of my own ever. I've never had a space of my own ever. It's been always communal living in one form or another due to poverty and necessity. And it's also been um, just constant motion because I was trapped on the hamster wheel of subsistence touring in order to support my family. And it wasn't until the lockdown that I started to even think strategically beyond that. That's the truth. That's, that's a ritual. That's, that's, you can create a new ritual now that you have. Yeah. So, yeah, that's funny because Allison, you, you know, the other thing you brought this, you mentioned this, but, um, you know, how, how a lot of songwriters told me when the, that it's when the pandemic first started, it was hard to write because you're just it's hard to write under great emotional weight, right? I mean, it's just and and Hemingway has this thing where Hemingway said he could never write in Paris when he was in Paris, he could never write in a place he needed distance to be able to write about that place. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel the same way with emotions, right? But some songwriters tell me that they need to be in that emotion to be able to write about it. Uh, others say they need distance to be able to write about it. Um, so uh, I guess Allison, I'll start with you. I mean, where do you? How do you fall in that? Is it? Do you need? Do you need space to be able to write about something, or is it better to be in the moment? That's a interest. I don't think it's an either or for me. Mm-hmm. I think it's more of a both. It's not zero sum. And also for me, writing helps give me some distance to process the emotion that I'm in. You know, I've always, my impetus toward creative writing was always mired in trauma just because of my life circumstances. Um, you know, survivor of 
15 years of childhood severe abuse. So it was, that's just where, you know, it's bound up for me. It's never been separate intense emotion and the urge to process that or re, I don't know if even process is exactly the right word. It's the need to control something, I suppose. Mm-hmm. And writing is the only thing, no matter if all the gigs go away, if whatever happens, you know, if all my fingers break, I could still write, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so writing for me, there's a comfort to it. It's never deserted me. Yeah. Uh, how about you, Aoife? Is that, is it, can you write for d d distance or is it more effective to write about something in that moment? I, I think I, the same, I agree with Allison here. It, it's definitely both. It's, I, I think during the pandemic, I, I mean, I wrote most of the music that's on the record that's about to come out during the pandemic. And it definitely puts, I mean, you could hear the pandemic in it, I think, and the, the pandemic makes it, itself known through the music, but it's not necessarily about the, the specificity of the pandemic. It's sort of like, it's just sort mm-hmm. of a shadow um, over over the top of it. I think that that sometimes if you're having, I think especially love songs I found are v- much easier to write when you're really in them. If you really are experiencing great heartbreak, I, I think it's easier to, for me, it, it has been easier to just get the song out, like to, to sit down and write it because I feel like you're just, and, and maybe it won't even be a very good song because maybe the, the distance is what will make it be a better song and a more universal song. But I think it's important to have that, have that experience of experiencing something and getting it out and then maybe editing it later. I don't know. I think it depends yeah. on, it depends on what the emotion is that you're trying to get, get out there. Gotcha. Uh, so key to editing later. I think about this all the time. I think about how much time I wasted as a younger writer trying to edit as I was creating you know, which is just so self-defeating. It's so self-defeating. Yeah. And, and I, if that's the only, any time, if anyone ever asks me advice about writing, which I try very hard not to give advice, you know, because everyone's process is so different and everyone's experience is so different. But I, the only thing I ever say is don't, don't prematurely edit yourself. Yeah, I think I, I would agree with that. And I think it's also that that's where the distance, I mean, that, that's where the distance comes in really handy is to be able to say, and it doesn't have to be tons of distance, but I think even overnight or even later that day, yeah. it's not always, you know, write something and then leave it for a year. In some cases it can be. I I've, I've, I mean, with with Prodigal Daughter, actually the song that, that we, that Allison sang on on my record that she just turned into something that it never could have been without her was something I started many years ago and I never was able to finish it um, until until the pandemic, until I sort of, I don't know, the story just kind of finished itself in my mind. Mm-hmm. After starting the song with Tim O'Brien during the pandemic, I was able to to look back on that and sort of take it to the next level. And then with Allison singing on it, I feel like it just went to an even, it went even further down that road. Mm-hmm. I, uh-huh. I have one, can I ask one question to Allison just because I'm so curious that as we're doing this songwriter process thing, because yeah. I know that you write so much with your husband, which that, yeah. that like really fascinates me as somebody who's married to a musician as well, not a songwriter. Um, and I, and I don't know, um, Ben, what your wife does, or if she's also a creative person, but I, I, I really would just love to hear, especially like on night flyer which just yes. an incredible song nominated for the grammy for americana song like i mean just so badass that you guys wrote that together and that you're now nominated for this award together i can you just tell me a little bit i, I don't i i, I don't want to like steal ben's questions but i'm or i can text you this and you can answer it no time. i want to hear it no this, this really is my dead. dream this is this is what i want please <laughs> um i'm i'm just like dying to know a like how like just how do you write a song like that with your husband i just i'm just really curious how that specific yeah. song what the process was for that song if you can just tell me because i'm Again, curious and the process I'm not trying well, to steal ben's um ben's question questioning i'm just no. genuinely curious not at all you know what is interesting Ifa, is jt and i really hadn't done that much co-writing until outside child we've done a little bit because he right he not a lot. did a lot of more of the writing on birds of chicago or, or it was more separate like it was he wrote it was seven more se- wrote no seven. he definitely did it was more separate and also the life of the band. We only had one year together as a band before I got pregnant and then had Ida. 
And for me, getting pregnant and having Ida was the beginning of a long, fallow period as a writer where I struggled to finish a song, I would say for almost four years until we, until we started the Our Native Daughters sessions, Songs of Our Native Daughters sessions um, for Smithsonian Folkways. And that was not until January of 2018 that we were actually recording those songs. They came out the following year, but we did a 10 day sort of intensive in um, the Bayou of Louisiana, Bow Bridge, Louisiana. And it was a similar thing to what you're talking about with getting together with Sarah and Sarah for I'm With Her, where we just, except that we didn't know, I mean, Rhiannon and I are like sisters and go back years and years. We met in 2006 at the Vancouver Folk Fest, but Amethyst and I just glancingly knew each other. I only really knew Layla through her brief stint in the chocolate drops before she started her solo career. We didn't know each other that well, but it was like this intensive immediate kind of floodgates opening um, that sort of broke the dam for me of the kind of writers. I don't even think of it as a writer's block anymore. I think I was like a fe- like an, like a field that had been drained of all nutrients and needed to lie fallow for a time. And I think it, there was like the enormity of being coming a mom and there was just the, all of that, which led to JT writing the bulk of the songs for Birds of Chicago right. for six of the seven years that we were really active, you know? Um, And then the Native Daughters thing happened and that kicked open the floodgates. And it was also the first time JT and I had a real separation. And the first time he was away from our kid, you know, I had been away from our kid for the Native Daughter sessions and he obviously held down the home fort and, and took care of Ida and then when I went on the Native Daughters Tour, we brought our kids with us. So I brought Ida with me and he went and did a writer's retreat um, at our friend Karen Mallory's place. Um, in she, she works every year for, um, um, oh my gosh, in Bellows Falls, Vermont, that wonderful festival that Ray Masuko puts on. Roots on the River. Thank you. Yes. She works every year for Roots on the River. What is wrong with me? My brain has left the building apparently. Um, I need to do some exercise, but it, Go. yeah, uh, she, so we met her there and she has this lovely sort of cabin kind of a place. And she let JT do a writer's retreat there while I was on the road with our native daughters through July of 2019. And that is when we started sharing dreams basically of my early childhood. And it was really one of the more, um, inexplicable and intense, but also intimate and powerful experience, creative experiences I've ever had with anyone. And it was our first time being apart that we suddenly, where I was sending him voice memos and sending him lyrics. And he was going, I think I just wrote the chorus of this song, you know, wow. and like writing it back and forth. I'm like, that is definitely the chorus of this song. That's so cool. You know, that is his chorus all the way. Um, you know, but then I was writing these verses and I have been upset, you know, we are, we both have, uh, deep wells of nerddom in us, <laughs> is what I would say of JT and I, and, you know, I had been obsessing over these Nag Hammadi scriptures, which, you know, the Nag Gnostic gospels are found among them, but also there's this one particular poem, Thunder the Perfect Mind. I don't know if either of you have read it, but it's one of the few clearly written from clearly a woman writing first person woman. Um, and this sort of expansive, deeply modern to my ears poem of sort of declaring your own dichotomies and contradictions and, but also like naming your power thereby, you know, and it's, it's a piece of poetry I've been obsessed with since I was 16 years old. And I was reading that a bunch for whatever reason on that tour. And that is that particular song definitely grows out of those meditations. It grows out of, you know, the meditations on motherhood and create an an art and how art for me has been a lifeline. And for so many people that I know who have totally different circumstances has been a lifeline, you know? And so that song was sort of, um, like a manifesto, I suppose, in a way for the whole record, you know, and it, that we, we, that was one of the first songs we wrote fourth day prayer and night flower were two of the first songs that we wrote. 
if they're like 